about translating tech talk into English. Mitch is the owner of Bellingham based web agency Bold Eye Media. He uses WordPress to help businesses, entrepreneurs, and nonprofits stand out online. Today he'll be sharing some tips on how to translate talk so you can be on the same page with your clients. He is also one of the lead organizers for Bellingham and WordPress meetups. Please uh, join me in welcoming Mitch Frank. Thank you. Let's get a show of hands. Who in this room has a client-facing role? Okay. Who's ever got lost in translation with a client? It happens. We're going to talk a lot about how to try to minimize that. Who's ever gotten frustrated because that client did not understand what you were saying? Awesome. This talk is for you. This talk is going to appeal to freelancers, designers, developers, and pretty much anyone in the creative space that's doing client-facing work. If you're doing client-facing work, you're also in sales. They don't really tell you that when you sign up for the job, or you become a freelancer, or even if you're a dev and all of a sudden has to talk to clients. Part of sales is being able to communicate with the client to understand their needs and how to best help them. Another part of working in a client-facing position is being able to translate jargon, but can also mean translating what they're telling you to your technical team. You know, you've had that client that said, oh, just do that, you know, just fix the little widget. And then you have to figure out what they're actually saying. Either you're doing the work and you're translating, or you need to translate it to somebody else. One of my clients told me that when typically that typically when she talks to techies, as she put it, she feels like they talk at her instead of to her. And so I kind of asked her, what do you mean? She said, well, a lot of times they're just talking in jargon and real technical talk, and I kind of leave that meeting with my eyes glazed over, and I feel like I have no idea what they just said to me. That's not a good feeling for anybody. Part of client communication is taking the customer on the journey with you and making them feel included. So that's one of the number one reasons why you're translating. So they don't think, you know, okay, we're building this website, we're doing it for this reason. Today I'm going to share some tips on client communication and translating tech talk or jargon into easier terms that your clients will understand. The thing to remember is that people do business with people they know, like, and trust. So who am I? My name is Mitch Britt, and she, as she said, uh, I'm a Bold Eye Media, a uh, little way of agency up in Bellingham. Um, we focus on being, helping businesses and managing the process so they don't have to do it. A lot, of it. a lot of businesses are very busy, so I try to take that off their plate. And you can see that I chose, like some others, they just choose a picture of themselves. I actually chose a picture of my wife and I. I did this because without her support, I, not would, be a, I would not be as far as I am today. Many of us creatives have significant others that we don't necessarily think that they are part of the business. Well, when they're supporting us in our journey, they really are part of the business, just because they're not writing code, writing content, designing, doesn't mean they're not helping us. I spent many years after college working in just basic HTML, CSS sites. A client wanted to make a simple change one day. All it was was updating business hours. And so they said, OK, well, that's not something at that time we can do really quickly. So I said, I can get to that the next day. This really was not very convenient for the client or the task they were even done, because they needed to change those hours and make it easy. After this, it started looking for a solution that would be more client friendly so that I can have them do some of these small tasks, like maybe change a picture, change a business hours, or change or edit a little piece of comma or uh, content. After spending a small, frustrating stint with Juma, I found WordPress, and I've never looked back since. The last part of my journey to get here was I was working a full-time job while I was building up the business. A lot of us have to do that. This year, I was able to transition out of that day job and work full full time on Bold Media. 
So if you're on this journey, and, you, and, and you're going to get frustrated, you're going to get burnt out, but the real drive, if you are on this journey, is to keep going, because one day you are going to find that freedom of your schedule and your time. Oops, wrong button. Okay. So I found, as I was putting this presentation together, I found this quote, and it was perfect. Speak to your audience in their language about what's in their heart, by Jonathan Lister. One of the best ways to get through to a potential client, or even a current client, is speaking in their language. This doesn't always, obviously have to always be in English, it could be in their native language. But it's also really just pulling it down so you understand what we're talking about. You know, not talking to them, you know, oh, this is PHP or CSS or things like that, and really making it client-friendly. This helps keep everyone on the same page, but it also helps with buying it. If you're trying to sell to somebody, and they don't know what they're buying, but the next person that they are talking to, the other web agency is translating, they're like, oh, okay, I know exactly what I'm buying, and they feel that relationship. So that's another part of this communication. So if you don't, if you can't communicate with them, how are you gonna know what their goals are, or even how to communicate with them? I'm gonna share some tips on it, on everything from web terms to translate, and also some of the ones not to translate. We also cover some features of website build and some examples of those translations. I will also share some tips about processes that make everyone's life easier. Lastly, we will cover some aspects of meetings, proposals, and even some tools to help you along the way. So as creatives, we run into a pitfall. A lot of times we let the client steer the ship. And I don't know if you've ever been on that ship when it hit rocks, but it is not fun. Those are times you can get scope creep, or you can get to a bad point of the relationship where they either just want to quit it or you know go find somebody else. So we're the captains of the ship. It is our job to make sure we don't run into rocks. And sometimes as creative, sometimes it's tough for us to stand our ground and say, this is the process, this is what works, and this is what we're going to do. So I, I was saying, if you let the client steer the ships, you're about to run rock. So try to avoid that. Does this mean don't build a solution the client is asking you to build? No. This means that, step, that stepping in when the client has a bad idea, such as using sliders on your website. There are times for sliders, yes, but metrics do show that sliders are not the best thing in the world, and they slow down your website. So sometimes you might have a client that's really insistent on a slider, and it's our job to educate them why that's not a bad idea. You don't just say, I'm not doing that, that's a horrible idea, you say, I'm not doing that because, and then show them, even sometimes, maybe even show them an article, and, and do that. It's also explaining how to do that. So we're, as we're, as part of our job, we're the tour guide of guiding them through this WordPress wilderness. If a DIYer kind of goes and tries to build a website on WordPress, it's kind of overwhelming. You have all these different options. It's our job to guide them through the darkness. So a lot of times, the client asks us to do certain things. Maybe like a certain piece of hosting, you know, or a certain tool, or something like that. I use the example of, do you go to the mechanic who's fixing, fixing your car, and ask them to use a very specific wrench when working on your car? No. You are paying them and the shop for their process which includes the tools that they use. So don't be afraid when you're doing client work or anything that there's a certain tool, maybe there's a certain hosting company that you like, or a certain theme, or certain plugins. 
you know, that is part of your process. There are many parts of the website build that we should translate to the client fields included. Some of these elements are vital to the success of the project. Number one is hosting. I don't know if any of you have experienced lots of different hosts out there, but it is treacherous. There are times where it can go perfectly great, and there's times you want to pull your hair out. The best thing when you run into those situations, the ones that pull your hair out, you never want to do business with them again. And if the client says, I want to use this company, you say, sorry, I don't do business with them. And then if they dig their heels in, that might be a red flag of not to work with that client. It is okay to say no to clients. Sometimes it's okay to say no to turn on the job because you can get in the whole world of heartache. Hosting is one of those things that we do have to translate because many times we're not lucky enough to get them without hosting. You get that client, oh, I've already got GoDaddy and I got this and I got this. So you need to either educate them on keeping them in that, in that environment or moving them to your environment. But you have to give a reasoning. You can't just say, oh, that thing that you just paid for, we're not using. So you have to explain, well, I use you know, for example, I use Flywheel. You know, so I use Flywheel here, this is part of my process, this is part of the package. When someone asked what it is, I typically say, hosting is where your website lives and what makes it run. And that if it's not built solid, it is bound to either fail or something bad will happen. I have recovered many hack sites on certain specific hosting companies. And so I decided not to do business to them. And I explained that to them. For me, I handle the hosting as part of the package. It is a build plus support. So I kind of take that out of the conversation a little bit. Say, hey, I'm here to take care of that for you. This has helped immensely reduce the problems that involves dealing with multiple different hosts. Because you don't have to figure out what each of the back ends look like, how its little nuances are, and everything. The sooner that you move to a process where you're always on one environment, the better, the more your life is going to be better, and you're going to be able to communicate that with your client easier. And you're going to spend less time on some of those kind of medial tasks of trying to get a hosting to work. Everyone has their own preference, so if you ever get on you know, Facebook, Twitter, Slack, whatever, and you ask what's the best hosting, you're going to get about a million replies. <laughs> so don't worry about that. A lot of times it takes experimenting with that hosting and seeing if it works with your workflow. Domain registrar. Sometimes you get to a point where you have that client that has an idea but they don't have a domain. So sometimes you have to go and try to find that for them. So when you talk about like domain registrar, you can typically say, you're basically paying for the right for that domain or .com, and you're paying for it yearly. Another part when I talk about domains is always buy the who is privacy. Because if you don't, you are bound to get at least, at least 100 emails and at least couple hundred phone calls because people see these lists of these new domain names and they say, oh, you're building a new website, do you want my help? And they will bug you. So, and when you don't do the domain privacy, like you can go and look up this.com, you can see, oh, this is who you are, this is where you live, and this is your phone number. I'm pretty sure you don't want that information out in the wild. <clears throat> Custom email addresses. I talk about this just because I talk about kind of the whole spectrum of things, but we're definitely in an age where having that at gmail.com or Outlook or Hotmail or MSN or Yahoo is not very professional. Are you going to want to do somebody business with somebody that emails you from Yahoo or Gmail? Less likely if you don't know that. 
it's a no respect factor. There's a lot of spamming going on right now with you know email hacking and things. So people look at that really closely right now. You know, is this real? So having a, a branded um, email address, you know, is a, you know big respect factor. It's and it's easier than ever to do it. I myself prefer Office 365. You know, just because I like having everything under one roof. But that's just my preference. SEO, the big, big buzzword. Your nowadays clients are asking more and more and more about SEO because they hear it like crazy. A lot of times, I just say it's optimizing your website and marketing efforts to be found on Google. And then I try to also explain to them that there's no magic bullet. Sometimes they just say, oh, you're just going to get my website on number one. Yeah, I wish I could. It's not just, you know, it's you know, flipping my wrist or, you know, fingers. But I'm not going to dive too much into that. Uh, Robert's actually got multiple talks this weekend on the topic. Google Analytics. You may not get clients asking about it, but it's a good thing to talk about. Because how are you going to know that something is successful unless you're measuring it? So a lot of times I explained, okay, I'm going to be sending you a report monthly, and I'll even grab a sample report and kind of go through what these things mean, you know, the balance rates, the visits, you know, things like that, so we can actually measure and know what we're doing. There are definitely going to be some terms that are best not to translate or even bring up. Because you might look like this woman on the left. You might look across the table at your client and they look frustrated, their eyes are glazed over, and they're lost. You do not want to be in that situation. So there's things like PHP, Amazon Web Services, HTML, CSS, maybe even specific plugins. They don't need to know that you're using Gravity Forms. They need to know if you hand off the site how to use it. But that's not very important. It is our job to help them, but not overload them. I think the biggest thing that sometimes we forget, no matter what we're doing, whether it's social media, websites, whatever, that a lot of times the clients that we're helping, it's probably the first time that they've asked for help for this. And they're going to be overwhelmed. So sometimes it's best to kind of slow down and kind of maybe even have multiple meetings so they don't get burnt out. Because you know, why are they going to want to hire you if they're just getting burnt out and frustrated and they feel like they need to go take a nap after talking to you? When we're talking with clients or even putting together a proposal, there's going to be a list of features that are going to go into the scope of work. And we already talked about in this last talk a little bit about content management systems. So CMS, or content management system, when I talk to a client, I say it makes it easier for you to edit your site. I have many clients right now that we're moving them to WordPress just to make their lives easier. They can have, you know, maybe it was Joomla, maybe it was another CMS, and they're just frustrated because they can't do it, or it's too frustrating for them. I like to say once the site is built, it'll be just as easy to edit as a Word document. Because most of them have used Microsoft Word for something here or there. Another aspect of the CMS to explain when we're talking to clients, that it is a piece of software with apps, or in this case, plugins, that need to be kept up to date. I always use an example of, you ever go to use your Facebook app on your phone and it doesn't work, and then you realize uh, it needs to be updated. Oh, it works now. Well, it's the same thing with a WordPress site, except it's even more extreme of, that's your business. I actually talked to um, a company at a WordPress meetup, very big company in our community. Uh, their design team uh, ran an update and wrote, broke the website for four hours. For some businesses, that's not a big deal. For this business, you probably lost a couple hundred thousand dollars in opportunity. And that's where daily backups come in as part of that. 
I always am a big fan of daily backups. They're an insurance policy or peace of mind that's in case something happens to the website that it can't come back to the next state. Daily backups, and so when I'm explaining to a client, I say daily backups, take a copy of your website so in case something happens. This isn't talked about much, but displaying reviews. Reviews are very important as a trust factor when choosing who to do business with. So a lot of times when I'm helping the client, I want to see if they have any testimonials, any Google reviews, Facebook reviews, Twitter, anything, any, any good um, raving fans. And something I like to do and explain that, okay, we're going to take and put this in an easy place for your website visitors to find and help those potential customers in the buying decision. So lead capture forms. Most contact forms that you see are name, email, phone number, and maybe contact. Well, if you had a lead come through and you just know it was Bob and his email on his phone and he just said, help me please, is that very helpful? No. All you need to do is at least ask a couple of qualifying questions at minimum. Do you have a current website? What, uh, you know, what is it? What's that .com or that .org or whatever it is? So you can actually look at it. So when you get that lead through, you're more qualified. The same goes with any type of business when they get a lead in. Just take the extra time and ask at least a couple qualifying questions. For me, I like to, on the lead forms, or in an intake form, is ask some of the three major goals of the project, and maybe even budget. And I know that pricing, you know, it's kind of the, oh, we don't want to talk about that, but sometimes it's good to feel out if they have a budget, if they don't, or even what that budget is. Because maybe you have a minimum, and they're under that minimum. Image optimization is something that's a little technical, but it's good to talk to them about, because sometimes people are taking pictures with their cell phones, and they're like, oh, this would be so cool to put on my website. And they don't realize how big those photos are. And they do this every day. And all of a sudden, their website is a 15, 20 second website. And they freak out and they call you and say, why is my website so slow? Well, that's because they were uploading huge images. So part of that education is saying, uh, yeah, don't do that. Or putting an Im image optimization plugin on there that can be running optimizations daily or what have you. Or maybe even say, hey, how about you send me those images? I will optimize them and go about our business. There's things within WordPress, obviously, you can take and resize it, you know, from 5,000 pixels down to 1,000 or what have you. And maybe that's part of the education with the client. There's also some other features uh, within the website build. And, you know, obviously we talked about content. Um, internal links can be very, very important. Whether it's, I and mean, that can be a button, that can just be a link within text. But it's, it's good to explain why that's there and where it's going. Because a lot of times, you get a client that says, well, I just want everything really easy to find, and they just want to throw it all in the menu or, or all on the, the home page, because they think there's no other way to get there. So you have to kind of explain that and kind of explain the flow, and you may even do a flow chart for them of this is how you get to this place. This is something that's relatively new, but live chat is becoming even, even more important, and we're getting used to using it. So I kind of let them know that it allows website visitors to connect with you through a piece of communication software, similar to text messaging, because there is an app on your phone that you can use to communicate with them. And that can be helpful. You can even automate and do certain you know, questions or common questions and get those answered right away for a customer. Donation button. Every once in a while I work with nonprofits and they're trying to find easier ways to collect donations. 
Now a nonprofit can create their own donation pages and not rely as much or heavily as on GoFundMe. If you're interested in learning more about this, go talk to GiveWP. They're, here, they're sponsored here. They're one of my favorites when it comes to donations. You can do all you can do is simply a donation form. You go in, it takes about three, four minutes, and the customer all they have to do is type in their name, email address, and donation amount, hooks with PayPal, and they can go, they can start collecting donations. Obviously, they have to collect that 2.9 percent, but they're not losing 20, 30, 40 percent to some of these other options. Portfolio. Portfolio obviously is something we use as creatives, but it can be more recent projects. If you're working with a construction company, a lot of times they don't think these things matter. But if you're going to go hire a contractor, you want to know what they built and what they worked on. And so sometimes it's hard to pry that information out of them. I have a current project right now that we're 90% done, but for the last three months, I've been waiting for them to give me projects. And they will not launch without these projects on there. So yes, there are certain pieces of content that can hang up a build, but they are very important. They can be as simple. The best thing when you're having a portfolio, recent projects, any of these things, is to have a formula or a recipe. Okay, just do one sentence and do, you know, for the construction company, it was a quick uh, overview of the project, um, the, the budget in this case, and the square footage, and some of the things that they did. This is coming up even more and more often is uh, premium fonts or branding fonts. We're finding that people want to get more creative, but they're also wanting to make everything match. You know, you don't want to have a nice logo and all of these things with like Helvetica content, Helvetica headings. You may want to actually have whatever that Google font is or that type kit. And branding and graphic designers and logo designers are starting to use that as a best practice and give that information to the client or even you. Oh, I use type kit whatever it was, and this is what it is, so it can be nice and branded. It's always good to keep the process simple when working with clients. I've found that it's good to have a process and kind of try to repeat that every single time. It's going to help with the communication, but it's also going to help with efficiency. One of the best decisions I made in my education so far was going through the WP Elevation Blueprint course. Part of that, a lot of that was about processes, you know, templates, other things about talking with clients, proposals. When you have certain repetitive tasks like onboarding or certain questions that are common, write them down. Have templates saved somewhere, even if it's in Word or whatever, just so you can copy and paste it because you're going to get a lot of the same questions. Reduce stress. The simpler your process is, the lower the stress will be for everybody. You do not want to finish a project and have a client just say, well, that just stressed me out. You want to have the one say, that was so easy. You did not stress me out, and we got everything we needed done. With a process, it's always good to tweak as you go. Sometimes. You also have to read the room. If you're working with a construction company, they might not want to go through your website worksheet or your intake form or whatever. They may want a little more phone time or hand holding. The meeting. When you're meeting with a, cut, a client for the first time, the number one rule is to listen. In client meetings, it's always good to listen, but it's also good to let them know that you have their attention. For me, I like to take and actually take my phone out, put it on, on um, off, and set it on the uh, uh, table uh, down, so they see, okay, my phone's not going to ring, you have my attention. Take notes. This is the biggest thing with meetings. If you go and do meetings, it's tough to remember everything. So take those notes, but take the notes in the language of the client. So 
so that you can repurpose those later in the proposal and meeting recaps and things like that. At the end of the meeting, I like to repeat the main points. It can be the goals, could be particular design, but I want to make sure that when I'm wrapping up those notes and putting in the proposal that we're on the same page. So there's no surprises and then we kind of go off into the wilderness. It's always good to use those notes and goals. For me, I always ask what's the top three goals of the project. Here's some example questions that I asked in a meeting with a potential client. We already went over this, but what are your goals? After going through the WP Elevation uh, blueprint, part of, the, part of it is what they call go by go deep. Part of this method is to ask what the top three goals of the, pro of the project are. Let that run through. But then ask which one is the most important and why. So then you know their number one goal is maybe to be number one on Google. Or maybe it's just to make their life easier and be able to make it easy to edit because their website is hard to edit. Who are your competitors? It is always good to know who their competitors are. One, you might want to see what their, those competitors are doing. We also want to know how they're ranking. But the client's going to tell you also about design. How they like the designs of those competitors' websites. Or maybe they're going to tell you flat out what they hate about it. Then you know not to do that. One of the bit, my, my favorite uh, questions to ask is how are you going to measure this, the success of this project? Some people might say, oh, so I can have Bob edit the website once it's built. Okay. Maybe it's the whole number one on Google thing. Okay, that's a totally different you know, thing. And that's something to pay attention to a lot in the scope of work. Because that's going to change the price of the website or the project, or social media, whatever you're doing, really, really much. Sometimes this gets a little technical, but I do like to ask, are there any specific features you would like to include? This is good because you're also going to get it in their language. They're going to say, oh, I wanted to do this really thing, or whatever, and like, okay, well, what do you mean? And then you, you, know, you translate it to make sure they're on the same page. The proposal is probably one of the most important parts of the process of the client. Obviously, the first impression is the meeting, but the proposal is very important because that's going to either A, land you the job, or not. It's always good to repeat notes from the meeting to translate any of those features that you talked about. Include the scope of work. Make it digestible and easy to read. You send them a 20 page document, they're probably only going to read a couple of pages. So make it easy. Include your process. So if you have a six week process, they're in six different phases, explain that to them. Because they're going to want to know what's the ETA and the launch date, what they're going to need to do in the, on their side of the fence for their kind of client homework. And that's part of getting the buy in too to show how professional you are. After covering all these tips, communication, there's some tools that make my life easier. Evernote. It's very, very simple, but it's a great piece of note-taking software. Sometimes I take the net client meeting notes and put them in there, and then pop those into better proposals. Or I'll even, in that working on ideas with the client, I'll just pop those in there. Better proposals is my uh, proposal uh, software of choice. It has many great templates so that you can spin up a proposal really fast. Very easy interface. Content snare. One of the hardest parts of gathering content, uh, of website project is gathering content. If you ever have these issues, and almost all of us do, check that out. The other last two are Client Portal and Active Campaign. Client Portal is an easy dashboard plugin, and Active Campaign is an email marketing software. Any questions? I'm on the other side on the client. Sure. I have a WordPress site where the child team wants to build it. Mm -hmm. 
I think the, the best, it's part of the conversation of, of starting to work with, with a, an agency or freelancer or developer. Typically, I, I would say most of us aren't gonna really necessarily charge for that, some will. Um, if I'm looking at, if I have a website that's currently built and I'm gonna be rebuilding it or tweaking it or something, I like to do that to know what I can quote because it's hard to kind of blind quote that. Um, so usually I'll spend you know, 20, 30 minutes getting in there and looking at it. Um, there will definitely be some people that uh, will charge for that hourly rate or things like that. Um, but that's a good t uh, kind of starting point of the conversation with a designer or developer. Um, and, and also kind of take and kind of, biggest thing with that I would say is uh, get your ducks in a row of what you hate and what you like in the current situation so that you can help the, the person on the side of the fence. You were talking about daily backups, and I was wondering which plugin you use for that. Sure. Um, so I personally, I have multiple layers of backups. Um, I use Flywheel, so that has backups, but I also use um, Manage WP um, because I'm managing many different websites. Um, as far as a plugin, uh, I recommend Vault Press um, is, a, is a great one. Um, Updraft Plus is also a good one. Uh, that one's free. What is that? Uh, Updraft Plus. The one thing I like about Updraft Plus is it's really easy um, to restore. You know, there's things like backup buddy and other things, but they're not as easy to restore. Thank you. not in the scope of work, you know, making it really clear what it was, and if I wanted to add that, what kind of about what that would cost. Um, I was wondering if that was something you could also recommend. Yes. Yeah, so it's good to, and obviously there's, it's good to do that, but there, the reason why I usually do that is sometimes it's things that are an idea that's either up in the clouds or something that they're not ready for yet. But it's good to do that so they know um, the reason why you want to put any of these things in your proposals or even like communication back and forth. So in case you as the client go back, oh, I thought this was included. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not, but we can add it. But it is good to add things as add-ons or things in your proposals to know what's available in the future. 